Well, welcome to the Cut for Time podcast here at the Canton United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Clay, joined by Eric Stearns, and today we're going to be digging into my message from Sunday, which was the continuation of our Moses series, uh, focusing on uh, God giving the Ten Commandments. And so Sunday we talked about just the overarching theme of like, why did God give these Ten Commandments? And so with our conversation today, we're going to dig into some of the specifics of how these Ten Commandments apply to our lives now, living in the new covenant of Jesus, um, the new command of Jesus, and how they can still be influential to our faith today. So let's get into it. Sounds good. Why do we still need to follow these? That's a great question. Jesus, what do we need? Or what do we need these for? Absolutely. Like I said on Sunday, none of these are contrary to the gospel that Jesus proclaimed. Um, none of these are contrary to the teachings of Jesus. Um, and and truthfully, like I think that these help us to shape what life in the kingdom of God should look like. Um, the kingdom of God as a present reality, the kingdom of God on earth, as we live out our faith as Christians, Jesus wanted the Hebrew people that he was preaching to, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, you know, the other outside groups that that made life more difficult. Jesus wanted to simplify things and bring things back to the very heart of what God was after in the first place. And so by looking to the example of Jesus and the way that he applied, like he applied these things um, to, to the way that he lived his life. And so I think that we still have that we still get to follow them because they do show us the way that Jesus wants us to do life. So one of the things I wanted to avoid on Sunday um, was to do a blow by blow of here are the Ten Commandments. I more wanted to stay on the kind of the conceptual level of the Ten mm-hmm. Commandments of just, you know, God gave Moses would eventually go on to give Moses 613 laws that the people of God had to follow. But it started with these 10. And like I said on Sunday, these 10 were very basic and mostly easy to understand and very easy to apply. And the the and the then the rest of the law would get a lot more complex and a lot more difficult. Um, you know, there were laws for just kind of basic sanitary reasons. There were laws for Um, different foods that could and could not be eaten. There were laws that dictated how sacrifices were made in the tabernacle and then eventually in the temple of, you know, how many times you have to spread blood on the, on the, on the altar for the, for the, uh, for the, for the sacrifice to be valid. Um, you know, and like, I really struggled with that passage with with those, those ideas of the law. Um, I was, I've been listening through the old Testament again, um, as I'm doing walking and stuff. And I messaged a friend of mine named John Anderson. And I was like, you, I need help understanding the importance of this. I, I need help understanding the reason why we have all of these laws that do get so, some of them just get downright repetitive, Mm -hmm. um, you know? And he just kind of helped me see that this is how seriously God takes holiness and how seriously we're supposed to take holiness. And so it starts with these 10, but expands out. But these 10 are, you know, 10 that kind of come back to, um, you know, they're not like they're not the entirety of the law summed up in the same way that like Jesus says that love God and love neighbor um, is the entirety of the law summed up. That's not exactly what the Ten Commandments do, but yet they still do set out a a standard. They do set out a standard vision for how life is supposed to operate. You know, love the Lord. God, I mean, to to you know, to begin with, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt um, when you were slaves. Like, let's not forget who I am, and then you'll have no other gods before me. That's number one. And like, there's a reason why, like, there's, there's, there's no ranking of importance, but I do think that number one is number one for a reason, because if we don't get number one right, the rest of it's just a goose, you know? Like, if we don't have this solid foundation of God is Lord, and there's only one, and we worship God, and we worship God alone, because God is the one that brought Israel out of slavery from Egypt, God is the one that sent Jesus to the world, God is the one that got our attention, that broke through our stuff, and led us to salvation. Like, this is why God matters. Um, you know, and so if, and if we don't have that solid foundation from the very start, nothing else come, that comes after it matters nearly as much um, mm-hmm. as, as having this understanding that God is who God is and we're supposed to worship God. And anything else that clamors for our attention or clamors for our devotion cannot win. 
you know, it cannot, cannot be the thing that is the number one thing. Um, mm-hmm. and so that's why that's number one. And that's why that's the one's important. So why do we have number two then? Like, why did God separate one and two? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, number two is re- in reference to how God is worshiped. Um, and the fact that, you know, and that, and that one is mainly just to separate the Hebrew people from religions from around their area. Um, cause like when they were in Egypt, there were statues that had to be worshiped. There were specific, you know, gods, the lowercase G gods that, you know, that they believed were these statues. Um, and so, and even in the, even in the other, other religions around them, um, you know, like a little bit later in the, in the old Testament, you know, Elijah will call down fire on the priests of Baal and Baal was a, you know, was an idol. And so God wanted the people to see that God was so far beyond anything that could be created. I mean, God is the creator, um, you know, and so God just wanted to make people aware that the way that the the way that the nations around them were doing things were not how God was calling them to live. That remained such a hard thing for them to understand. I mean, like I have talked about on Sunday, a little bit of a tangent that I went on is that, you know, as Moses is up on the mountain getting this law that says, hey, by the way, don't make for yourself a graven image. The people of God are down below begging Aaron to make for them a graven image. And Moses, you know, throws down the tablets and says, "Okay, we have fundamentally misunderstood what's going on here. Let's reset. God, I'm going to need a couple more. I'm going to need a couple more of those tablets. Um, you know, yeah, it's just it's fitting that he comes. Oh my down gosh, yes, isn't it? Calf sitting there. Yes. Yep. So no, we don't need to do that anymore. God is calling us to something different, and God is calling us to something bigger by worshiping mm-hmm. a God that is does not need uh, an idol to be represented. God is just simply present. And it, it seems the you know throughout the Old Testament. They're always looking for something different, always looking for something that the other religions have, whether it's a king or something else. They always want God to fit into someone else's box because they feel like that way is better for some reason. Yep. You know, we kind of do the same thing, you know, not necessarily with God, but just with our lives. I want my life to look like their life, even though I don't actually know what their life is like. Right. Maybe my life is actually really good. Because it's different from what they have, I want that. Yep. You know? Yep. Yep. Which is kind of jumping ahead to number 10 of, you know, not coveting, you know, coveting, mm-hmm. coveting all of the things. Do not desire another man's house. Do not desire his wife, his slaves, his cattle, his donkeys, or anything else that he owns. Like, coveting is a powerful force. That comparison game of, well, you know, I want to keep up with the Joneses and, you know, yeah, make keep up appearances and all of these things that we, you know, distract ourselves with that, that pull our attention off of God. Yeah. Yeah. And it just doesn't add to our quality of life. It had, you know, that comparison game and always finding ourselves lacking uh, because that's how that works. Um, You know, it just doesn't add anything to our life of benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We all just do it. So we sure do. Mm hmm. So the next one then is do not use my name for evil purposes for I, the Lord, your God will, will punish anyone who misuses my name. And this is the one where I think that we get the most off track um, because th- there are things that people assume that this word means that it doesn't necessarily mean. Uh, people will use this to say that you can't say cuss words and that's really not what it is. People will also say that this means that we can't say, you know, when we bang our th- bang our thumb with our hammer, you know, oh, God, that hurt. Like, we shouldn't say that just because I think that there's better vocabulary out there. But that's really not what using God's name in vain really is talking about. It, it may be an aspect of it, but it's not really what that's one that one is all about. What that one is about is saying that we're, you know, that we're going to swear to God that we're going to do something and then not doing it. Like mm-hmm. that does that 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 type of a, that type of an invocation of God's name does not need to happen, um, you know. And and if you do swear by God, then you darn sure better do it. You know, like if I say to you, you know, uh, you know, 
with God as my witness, I'm going to bring you fresh baked cookies to church on Sunday. I better be baking on Saturday, you know, because I said with God as my witness, I better get that sucker done. Um, and so, and then also just the other, the other side of that, um, is not taking God's name when we do something that we're not supposed to do in the first place. Um, you know, I, my, my mind is drawn to the crusades of the, you know, of the, of church history where they were, you know, going out into wars in the name of God against Muslim people and, you know, killing people because God told them to, Mm, no, that doesn't pass muster because in a couple, a couple commandments from now, God is going to say, don't commit murder that those, those things are not mutually exclusive, um, from one another. So if God is, you know, you can't just do whatever you say you, that you want to do because God told you to. That's not how that works either. Um, you know, there is a call of God on our lives, but that takes prayer and discernment and time to to figure out. We can't just, you know, we're not going to carry out atro- atrocities in the name of God. That's not how that works. That's taking God's name in vain. That is t- using God's name flippantly um, in a way that does not bring honor to God's name. And that's what that one's about. Yeah. Cult leaders. That have Correct. used God to to skew people's mindsets and absolutely end up killing all of them or you know stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So, how do we handle then? Um, you know, you say the Crusaders and killing people in God's name and all that stuff. What do we do with the rest of the Old Testament when the Hebrew people are killing all sorts of all over the place? Right, There's, they're there's death and destruction in God's name. What do we yeah. do with that? Yeah, I I really don't have a good answer for that. I really, really struggle with that too. Um, you know, like the only thing that I can even try to hold on to is the fact that God said that there would be the inhabitants of this nation, uh, that they would be the ha- would be the inhabitants of the land, uh, of the of the holy land of the promised land. And yeah, I, I really struggle to say that God called them to do that or that God commanded them to do that, even though that's what a plain text reading of the Old Testament does say, um, mm-hmm. you know, but I, 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 I don't have a good answer to that of how we how we hold those things exclusively or how we hold those things together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely contrary. It's, mm-hmm. it's a tough thing to, to wrap your head around. Yes, for sure. Yep. That may be the next question I ask Dr. John Anderson because he is an Old Testament professor and he's Report back next done, week. I will I'll do my darndest. Yeah, I'll do my darndest. So number four, remember the question. Sabbath day and keep it holy. Mm-hmm. Does that mean we can't mow our lawns on Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, there are people that do take it that strictly. Um that that say that no work means no work. Um and that that is work. I mean, there are there are further laws in the Old Testament that further clarify and codify what constitutes as work um, and, you know, has led to people of Jewish descent um, working around those things quite a bit. Um, you know, I remember a story from a pastor a colleague of mine that said that uh, there was a Jewish family in his neighborhood and on the Sabbath he would have to go over and do things for them because they couldn't do it, but they still needed to get done. I mean, I do think that it is, um, you know, I, I think that it is important for us to realize that as important as work is, there is still a command to rest. There is still a call to rest from God to lay aside work for a time to not just be lazy and, and you know, and, and you know, and, and just kind of let it go, but to use that time to focus our attention on God. I think it's just so important to refocus yourself. Mm-hmm. If all you're doing is working, 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 you burn yourself out so quickly. Yes. And if you don't take it at least one day to not to not work. Yep. It yeah. just it wears you out. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So like there's a story from Moses's own life where his father in law saw that he was doing exactly that and was working and working and working and burning himself sitting as the sole arbiter of the things of the house of the people of God. And he has to say to him, what you're doing is not good. 
Like, you are going to kill yourself. You've got to stop this. You've got to enlist more people to do the work that you're supposed to be doing. And and you know, and not it's not just all on you. Yes, God called you, but it's not all on you. And so you need to find some people to help out. Um, and so that's where the, the first election of elders happened because Moses was going to kill himself. Um, you know, and and drive yeah. himself to the point of no return. Um, and so yeah, so there there is that that aspect of us needing that rest. Um, there's also a there's also an, an incident in the New Testament where Jesus sends the disciples out to go and do all the amazing things, and the disciples come back. And like the, the crowds see all of this. And so the crowds form around Jesus and Jesus says to his disciples, go away and rest for a while and take a break. You've earned it. You, this is, this is going to be Sabbath. Go rest. I've got this. Don't worry about the crowds. I've got this, you know? And then Jesus sits down and teaches and that leads to the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark's gospel. It's something that Jesus modeled. It is something that Jesus insisted upon. And so it is still a command that is good for us too. So number five, honor your father and mother. I feel like that should be pretty self-explanatory. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it should what be. What I find interesting is with the with the last, it should be. Huh. The last five or six, you know, it I feel like the theme really changes. Mm-hmm. Where they're more of this, it's not abstract for one through four, but it's more of a, an idea. Right. And then the last six are like, no, you're going to do these things. Right. And these are much easier to understand. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there have been people that will break out the Ten Commandments into categories further. And the first four are about our relationship with God. And the last mm-hmm. are the, the, the first four are about our relationship with God. And the last six are about our, about our relationship with other people. So, you know, sure. the first four are, you know, no gods before me, no graven images, um, use my name respectfully and observe the Sabbath. And then it is this family relationship. Do not, you know, respect your father and mother, honor your father and mother, you know, and if you do so, it'll go well with you. And then it gets into how do we deal with other people? We're not going to murder. We're not going to commit adultery. We're not going to steal. We're not going to accuse people falsely, or we're not going to tell lies and we're not going to be covetous. And so that is about how we relate with other people. So yeah, there is a definite shift for sure. And you're not the only person to notice that if you think that if you think that there's a shift, you're not crazy. There is a shift. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And you think about just all of these things, whether it's the first four or the last six or whatever. Mm-hmm. If you follow these things, your life is just better. Yeah. You know. In in a time where adultery doesn't maybe doesn't uh receive as much importance as it should. Right. You just think about how much that screws up that doing that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. The damage that gets done, not just to the relationship between spouses, but the relationship between spouses and kids. I mm-hmm. mean, the things that we're doing to kids is, you know, I mean, something that I, I mean, I do a lot of youth ministry work and it's just the, the things that I see and the things that I hear from kids and the way that like, you know, their parents having such a messed up relationship does truly impact them in a way that is unjust in a way that it is, you know, causing undue harm to already hard times, you know, so. Yeah. We're so quick to blame the kids that the kid it's the kid's fault that they're misbehaving. It's the kid's fault doing X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. It's our fault. As yeah. parents, we're the ones who are screwing up. And we need to do a better job of raising our children, of being good examples to our children yep. of how they should act. Yes. For sure. Hold on to that thought for two weeks because we're going to get there. So <laughs> the one thing I do want to mention, though, uh, with honoring our father and mother, um, you know, there are unfortunate situations um, where, you know, where, where certain parents are not worthy of honor. And mm-hmm. so like, I, I wrestle with a lot. I wrestle a lot with the question of how do we maintain this while still also, you know, keeping ourselves safe and sane. Um, you know, and I think that the best way that we can honor somebody, um, with that, with that difficult relationship that we're having, the best way that we can honor somebody is by praying for them. Um, and that, that's not all that that comes 
from, to, from, from how we honor our father and mother, but sometimes that's all that we can do. If it is not a safe situation for us to be honoring of them, but yet we still have this commandment sitting, staring us in the face, the least we can do. And, and sometimes, sometimes the most and the least we can do is be in prayer for them that they may see the light of God and, you know, realize that they have a responsibility to, you know, to, to, to be honoring to their children, to, to, to be the ones that nurture and, and care. And, you know, this is our charge as parents. Uh, I didn't want to move um, forward before we talked about that. So, yeah. And I think that's a great point too, as parents, we need to be people who are worthy of being honored. Mm hmm. You know, we need to live up to that as parents just as much as we need to honor our parents. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Parenting is a lot harder than you think it should be. Not for the faint of heart by any stretch of the definition. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So do any of them stand out? I mean... Do any of them stand out as hard for you? Thankfully, no. <laughs> fair. It's a fair answer. You know, um, the first four are a lot harder than the last six, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it all becomes is it's all because numbers five through ten are tangible. Sure. You don't. God, and it, it's, it's, I'm, I'm putting God in a box right now that he's not tangible because he is, but, right. But it's but a different it's so relationship. Different. Oh, yes. You know? And so it's almost easier for us to flake on the first four and follow the last six. Mm hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I'm not getting arrested tomorrow if I don't honor God. <laughs> I go shoot someone now. Right. We'll have I'll have more of an immediate problem. Uh huh. Definitely. Yes. You know? Yep. That is not an excuse, but that's just you know. Yeah. No, for sure. I think we as a society have a hard time with the first four. Um, you know, the the ones about God are the hardest ones, um, because we want immediate satisfaction, and a lot of the time that that does that's not how God operates. Um, you know, and so, and that was the, the problem that the Israelites had is that they wanted, they, they wanted God to operate in a certain way. And when God wouldn't operate the way that they, that they, that they wanted God to operate, they would go try and find something else. If it's not God, then it's going to be something lesser than God. You know, and maybe I'm just telling on myself at this point, but, you know, honoring God as putting no other gods before God, um, you know, is is tricky because like we've talked about before, there are so many things that clamor for our attention and clamor for our ultimate devotion and like try to define us in a way that only God should and can, you know, like I'm a lot of things because I am a United Methodist and like my my denominational identity always has to be less than what God called me to be. Like I am called as a follower of Christ first. I'm called as a Christian first. I'm called as, as a disciple first. I just happen to be a United Methodist, you know, right. and I just, you know, and then there, and then there are other things too, you know, especially in this, you know, political landscape that we're in, you know, if you're a Republican or a Democrat, there's, there has to be more to your personality than your, than your political party. And there, and there has to be a higher devotion than, your preferred candidate. Our 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 ultimate devotion has to be to God. And it's really hard to see that sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And even what you know, even what teams we cheer for. Um, you know, like there's a there's a great video from Skit Guys that talks about how, you know, there are people that that paint their faces and they gather together and they they do cheers and they they're trying to like they're trying to like stage it like they're talking about some, you know, wild culture from a developing nation and then they start to like say the, all the same stuff again but the visuals are of football fans of people that have painted their chest or painted their faces or you know you know, and not that there are not that it's bad to cheer for a team because we both know who our teams are, um, you know, and that there's not a lot of agreement with our teams, but we're friends anyway, um, you know, 
Um, but, but it can go too far just like anything else. You know, I, I can't, I can't dislike Jared because he's a Packer fan and I just, I can't dislike mm. you because you're a Vikings fan. We can talk but about that. Keep it holy. <laughs> keep it holy. So I can't write people off because right. they cheer for a different team than I do, but there are people that, that will, and that do, you know? And so that, that, that is Part of that, putting no other gods before God, that's one of those sneaky ways that I have a tendency to fall into, you know, I'm a Bears fan and everyone else can suck a rock. Or we just put sports in general in front of everything else, you know. Yep. Kind of feels like it's one of those idol type things. It certainly can be. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and that's I think that's part of why, you know, having these conversations about the Ten Commandments is important because they can be even though they can be easy to apply in theory and on paper, they can get pretty tricky. Yeah. Well, even like you said, even like with identifying as United Methodist, if we're putting that in front of God, that's even though it's a good thing. Right. It's still yeah. above what it should be. Or if we're really mm-hmm. focused on supporting our kids to the detriment of our faith, it's still not still not what God calls us to do. Right. What are you going to talk about Moses next week? Yeah. So next week we're going to be focusing more on how the people of God um, could get so far off track so fast, um, and they they grumble just constantly. Everything that happens, Moses is blamed for it and they grumble against him. And um, so we're going to be looking at the way that God provides in the midst of that. Um, we're going to be looking at a story specifically from the book of Book of Numbers um, about how God provides, you know, God starts to, pro- to, pro- to provide manna when they're hungry in the wilderness. And so every day they have this fresh manna bread from out of nowhere because that's that's God. That's God's provision for them. Um, you know, and so they're, then they're, they're given the instruction, collect what you need for the day. It will go bad by the morning. Like, trust me, trust me. And, you know, every single, and so that's fine for a little bit, but then they start to be a little bit, you know, hangry if we're being completely honest and they say, okay, yeah, this bread is cool and we're glad that we have it, but yet, you know, that's not enough anymore. And so God is willing to provide what they need in order to trust. And so it happens through quail this time. They're given not just bread, but they're also given meat. They're giving what they need to be sustained. And then God says, trust me. And then how do they respond to that? And so in our own lives, when we are tempted to grumble and complain, when we get to that, like, you know, that that coveting and that comparing, you know, where I want my life to look like his life and I'm going to grumble and, and, and be you know, be sour about it until it happens because there are people like that. And sometimes that's me. Um, You know, what do we need in order for us to trust God? What did the people need in order to trust God? And how did God provide that? And how can we trust in God's provision in the midst of all of our lives as well, too? So that'll be what we focus on on Sunday. Sounds good. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining us on this week's Cut for Time podcast. Join us again next week in person at 10 a.m. at the church uh, or on Facebook Live or back here for the podcast next week. Thanks for listening to our Cut for Time conversation. Join us for worship in person or on Facebook Live Sundays at 10 o'clock Central Time. And now go in peace and serve the Lord.